In one form or another, the myth of the fully automatic model has become extremely plausible, and in some scientific and academic disciplines, it is as much a sacrosanct dogma as any theological doctrine of the past, despite contrary trends in physics and biology. For there are fashions in myth, and the world-conquering West of the 19th century needed a philosophy of life in which real politic, victory for the tough people who face the bleak facts, was the guiding principle. Thus, the bleaker the facts you face, the tougher you seem to be. So we vied with each other to make the fully automatic model of the universe as bleak as possible. Nevertheless, it remains a myth, with all the positive and negative features of myth as an image used for making sense of the world. It is doubtful whether Western science and technology would have been possible unless we had tried to understand nature in terms of mechanical models. A made universe whether of the crackpot or fully automatic design, is made of bits, and the bits are the basic realities of nature. Nature is therefore to be understood by microscopy and analysis, to find out what the bits are and how they are put together. But it is not enough to describe, define, and try to understand things or events by analysis alone, by taking them to pieces to find out how they are made. This tells us much, but probably rather less than half the story. Today, scientists are more and more aware that what things are and what they are doing depends on where and when they are doing it. If, then, the definition of a thing or event must include definition of its environment, we realize that any given thing goes with a given environment so intimately and inseparably that it is most difficult to draw a clear boundary between the thing and its surroundings. Eastern philosophy has understood this basic unity for thousands of years. The assumptions underlying Far Eastern culture, and this is true as far west as India also, is that the whole cosmos, the whole universe, is one being. It is not a collection of many different beings who somehow floated together like a lot of flotsam and jetsam from the ends of space and ended up as a thing called the universe. They look at the world as one eternal activity and that's the only real self that you have. I never forget once I um, was sent out in the countryside and a piece of thistledown flew out of the blue, came right down near me and I put out a finger and I caught it by one of its little tendrils. And it behaved just like catching a daddy long legs. You know, when you catch one by one leg, it naturally struggles to get away. And this thing behaved just like that. And I thought, well, it was just the wind doing that. It only appears to look as if it was doing it. Then I thought again, wait a minute. It is the wind, yes, but it's also that this has the intelligence to grow itself so as to use the wind. You see that? That is intelligence. That little structure of thistledown is a form of intelligence just as surely as the construction of a house is a manifestation of intelligence. Western thinkers have chopped the world up into little bits for purposes of intellectual convenience, forgetting how the bits go with one another. In the same way, the self has been chopped up, leaving us in touch with nothing but our conscious egos. Children are tricked into the ego feeling by the attitudes, words, and actions of the society which surrounds them, their parents, relatives, teachers, and above all, their similarly hoodwinked peers. Other people teach us who we are. Their attitudes toward us are the mirrors in which we learn to see ourselves, but the mirrors are distorted. You remember when you were a little child, and the teacher said to you, Pay attention! Or you really must try harder to read, to calculate, to remember a list of facts. And what did you do when the teacher told you to try? What could you do? Why, you made your muscles go tight. You frowned when you tried to read. You went tight round your ears when you tried to listen. Though in the same way, 
the way people screw themselves up and clench their teeth and clench their fists and frown in order to be mentally efficient is completely irrelevant, just like straining at your seat to get the jet plane off the ground. Nerves do not work with muscles. So therefore, the idea and feeling of ourselves which we have is an inaccurate image married to a futile effort. We have been sold on having a completely false sense of who we are. We've identified ourselves with this image and with this absolutely useless piece of muscular tension. We're not that. What else could we be? See? Well, isn't it obvious? At least it is obvious to me. I, I, it seems so obvious that I hesitate to think whether I can explain it. But it seems completely obvious to me that what I am is what is going on. In other words, if I, as far as I can look at night and see the galaxies, that's what's going on. And th this is me. So to me, I've been shown, it is to me absolutely obvious that I, there is no other I than the entire universe. How, how, what other way could it be? That's equally true for every one of you. Nevertheless, our society instills the firm conviction that beyond this wall of flesh lies an alien world. It has pulled this trick on every child from earliest infancy. In the first place, the child is taught that he is responsible, that he is a free agent, an independent origin of thoughts and actions, a sort of miniature first cause. In the second place, the child is commanded as a free agent to do things which will be acceptable only if done voluntarily. We demand that you love us because you want to, his parents tell him, and don't just love us because we say you ought to. Children are in no position to see the contradictions in these demands, and even if some prodigy were to point them out, he would be told summarily not to answer back, and that he lacked respect for his elders and betters. Instead of giving our children clear explanations of the game rules of the community, we befuddle them hopelessly because we, as adults, were once so befuddled, and, remaining so, do not understand the game we are playing. In fact, the self-imposed task of our society and all its members is a contradiction, to force things to happen which are acceptable only when they happen without force. This, in turn, arises from the definition of man as an independent agent, in the universe but not of it, saddled with the job of bending the world to his will. No amount of preaching and moralizing will tame the type of man so defined. The hypnotic hallucination of himself as something separate from the world renders him incapable of seeing that life is a system of geological and biological cooperation. We must learn to include ourselves in the round of cooperations and conflicts which constitutes the balance of nature. There is no other way for us to survive now. A permanently victorious species destroys not only itself, but all other life in its environment. The individual may be understood neither as an isolated person nor as an expendable humanoid working machine. He may be seen instead as one particular focal point at which the whole universe expresses itself, as an incarnation of the self, of the Godhead, or whatever one may choose to call it. This view retains and indeed amplifies the idea that the individual is in some way sacred. And at the same time it dissolves the paradox of the personal ego, which is to have attained the precious state of being a unique person at the price of perpetual anxiety for one's survival. Let it be clear, furthermore, that the ego fiction is in no way essential to the total human organism in fulfilling and expressing its individuality. For every individual is a unique manifestation of the whole, as every branch 
is a particular outreaching of the tree. To manifest individuality, every branch must have a sensitive connection with the tree, just as our independently moving and differentiated fingers must have a sensitive connection with the whole body. The point, which can hardly be repeated too often, is that differentiation is not separation. Our society is defining the individual with a double bind, commanding him to be free and separate from the world, which he is not, for otherwise the command would not work. This is palpably absurd, and since the task is never achieved, the individual is taught to live and work for some future in which the impossible will at last happen, if not for him, then at least for his children. We are thus breeding a type of human being incapable of living in the present, that is, of really living. For unless one is able to live fully in the present, the future is a hoax. In times past, recognition of the impermanence of the world usually led to withdrawal. On the one hand, ascetics, monks and hermits tried to exercise their desires so as to regard the world with benign resignation or to draw back and back into the depths of consciousness to become one with the self in its unmanifest state of eternal serenity. On the other hand, there were those who felt that the world was a state of probation, where material goods were to be used in a spirit of stewardship, as loans from the Almighty, and where the main work of life is loving devotion to God and to man. Yet both these responses are based on the initial supposition that the individual is the separate ego, and because this supposition is the work of a double bind, any task undertaken on this basis, including religion, will be self-defeating. Just because it is a hoax from the beginning, the personal ego can make only a phony response to life. For the world is an ever-elusive and ever-disappointing image only from the standpoint of someone standing aside from it, as if it were quite other than himself, and then trying to grasp it. Without birth and death, and without the perpetual transmutation of all forms of life, the world would be static, rhythmless, undancing, mummified. But a third response is possible. Not withdrawal, not stewardship on the hypothesis of a future reward, but the fullest collaboration with the world as a harmonious system of contained conflicts, based on the realization that the only real I is the whole endless process. This realization is already in us in the sense that our bodies know it, right down to our bones and nerves and sense organs. We do not know it only in the sense that the thin ray of conscious attention has been taught to ignore it, and taught so thoroughly that we are very genuine fakes indeed.